Amen. Good morning, everyone. Man, it's so good to see you here today again, and uh, I welcome you, and just want to go ahead and say, based on that introduction, we all know that Kroger Discount Gas is where it's at, right? <laughs> and, I mean, the way I feel about it is if you want to pay more for your food, feel free to go to HEB, but... Uh, and I know in this moment, I lost many of you, or the rest of you are just judging me in this moment. You know, a while back, uh, I don't know how long ago, but a while back, uh, I received in the mail a very nice invitation to attend an event. Uh, that event was a couple of weeks ago. It wasn't here in Baytown, it was out of town, so I made sure I looked up the address, got it all pulled up in my phone, I made sure that I left with plenty of time because I'm one of these people I don't like to be late. I'd rather be early than late. And so I made sure I had plenty of time and to show up for this event. And uh, this special event was called Jury Duty. <laughs> yes, me and over a hundred of my non-closest friends in Chambers County all showed up to be given the opportunity to share why we didn't think we should serve on the jury. Now what's sad is, I personally didn't fit into any of the categories that the judge described. I tried, but it didn't work. I received, not long after that, about a little over a week ago, another invitation to come to court on Monday, May 8th, at 8.30 a.m., to see if the prosecutor or the defense would see fit that I would, uh, you know, that I would fit in the jury of whatever trial it's going to be. Now, what I think is interesting is that when you talk about jury duty, people have a whole lot of different opinions about that. But I would have to say that the majority of people that I talk to about serving on jury duty, it's not a very positive thought process for them. A lot of people think, oh, it's just a waste of time and I have to leave work and I have to worry about my kids and yada, yada, yada. And, uh, you know, people just... When you say, hey, jury duty, there's just not a lot of enthusiasm. And I've attended jury duties many times before in Harris County, before I moved to Chambers County. And uh, I've actually only been picked once. It was for a real small traffic violation, which was kind of an easy deal because there was videotape. <laughs> I'm like, guilty. Anyway, um, but I'm not sure why I don't get picked for juries more often. It could be the t-shirt that I wear on that day that says, hang them high. But uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I really don't, but it might work. Uh, here's, here's my opinion about this whole idea about jury duty. I think a lot of people struggle with the idea of jury duty because... Deep down inside our hearts, we have this kind of innate fear of having to pass judgment on someone that we do not know. Now, sometimes that judgment is pretty, in, a, in my opinion, minor, like a fine. That's, that's what it was in the one I was on. It's just a fine. But in reality, we know that there are other court cases that the judgment could mean a lifetime in prison or maybe even the death sentence. And a lot of times we struggle with this idea of, I don't know if I want to serve in a capacity that will impact someone's future. Which brings me to what I want to talk about with you today. We're in this series called, I'm Right, You're Wrong. It's a play on words. But in this series, we want to talk about this reality that in every relationship, whether it be kind of a intimate, close relationship, or even a distant relationship, a work relationship, a neighborhood relationship, there is, whether we care to admit it or not, there's always conflict. Relationships have conflict. And if you remember last week, as Jeremy kicked off this series, he talked about where conflict comes from. Conflict comes, according to scripture, from a three-letter word, sin. And Jeremy used this phrase that I thought about this week, is that we are broken people relating to other bro broken people, or we are sinful people relating to other sinful people in a broken world. And as a follower of Jesus, how do we handle conflict within relationships? And specifically, and it's going to be kind of 
you know, I get it touchy. <laughs> Specifically, I want to talk about how judging or being judgmental can raise conflict up within a relationship. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, take them and turn to Matthew chapter 7. That's where we're going to land in just a minute, Matthew chapter 7. But I want to pick up real quickly where Jeremy left off last week in James chapter 4. He ended with verse 10. I want to pick up verse 11 where James writes, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. Your translation may say, Do not slander one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? And then in Matthew chapter 7, we pick up the words of Jesus who is actually teaching during his most famous sermon, we spent a lot of time here, Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you, you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye, you hypocrite? First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now I want to take just a second to address what I consider, you may not consider this, but what I consider a potential elephant in the room talking about the subject matter of judging. Because I think there are times that people take the two passages of Scripture that I just read, and what they do is they take those verses and they use them against people who are considered Christ followers, and uh, they, they kind of use them to condemn believers that we are self-righteous righteous, or judgmental if we have anything to say on moral or biblical truth. You might have heard people say, you aren't supposed to be judging me, or the phrase my kids like to use at me when they're doing something they shouldn't do, stop judging me, Dad. And even some believers struggle with speaking the truth in love, Because they don't want to come across as being judgmental or judging someone. But I want to call your attention to what James has to say. And even Jesus uses the same phrase. James uses the word brother or brothers, just like Jesus does. Jesus uses the word brother or brothers. In other words, he want, I want you to understand, I want to remember that James and Jesus are both talking to fellow believers. And what I think we don't need to miss in this, and I'll, I'll unpack this a little more, is that we need to understand as followers of Christ, it is okay to have a biblical worldview. As followers of Christ, it is okay, even though we live in a world with relative truth, that we stand on an idea of absolute truth called the Word of God. It's okay to build your life on the Word of God, as the song we sing says, it is a firm foundation. And if you are to speak the truth in love... Sometimes people aren't going to like it. Sometimes people might label you as self-righteous and so on. But if, if, big if, if you are actually speaking the truth of God's word, not your opinion, not your conclusion, if you are speaking the truth of God's word in a situation, Someone might have a problem with it, but their problem isn't necessarily with you. Their problem is with God. 
because they don't like what he said. And I will also add this. By the way, all this is free. I haven't even got to the sermon yet, all right? (laughs) I'll add this. God's word has much to say about the cultural and moral wars that are taking place in our world right now. And I would declare that someone's potential feelings do not trump God's authority on that subject matter. Be careful that you say amen, all right? It is true. But we have to be very careful as followers of Christ that we do not use God's word to bully people. We have to be very careful. Remember, I've used the phrase multiple times already, and I will say it again. It is okay to speak the truth as long as you are speaking it in love. In love. James is very clear. (laughs) I think this is interesting. James is very clear that no one, no follower of Christ, because he uses the word brother, no one has the right to slander someone. He uses the phrase, the, the phrase I read is, you know, uh, he said, do not speak evil. Your translation may say, slander, do not slander. No one has the right to speak against one another or to slander one another. And both James and Jesus use the word judge And that word, when they use the word judge, does not mean evaluation. That's what, you know, self-righteous people think. Oh, well, I'm just evaluating this situation. Or I know what some of you grew up in church long enough, you're going to say, well, doesn't the Bible say that we're supposed to judge one another by our fruit? So I can be a fruit inspector, can't I? What Jesus is saying is do not judge, and don't miss this, that word judge carries the weight of the word condemnation. Both, both are talking about condemnation, not necessarily evaluation. In in fact, when the Bible speaks of us as followers of Christ, the Bible says that we're to be known by our what? By our love for one another. That's how we're supposed to be known. By our love for one another. And you can't be very loving if you're in the business of condemnation. Just say that flat out. You won't be. In fact, I'll even add this and then I'll get to my sermon. James says, there's only one judge and one lawgiver. And can I just say it this way? You ain't him. You're not. So, let's begin by establishing a kind of a foundation of what we mean by this word judge, because I think this is critical. This is a definition I'll throw at you. This is probably not the most concise definition, but it's simplistic. Judge, to judge, means to form an opinion or conclusion about someone or something. In other words, you, you uh, think of someone or you think of something, and as a result, when you judge that situation, it means you are forming an opinion or a conclusion about them. Now, fair warning, I'm, my goal is to make everybody in the room feel uncomfortable right now in this moment. But I think everyone in this room, myself included, whether we care to admit it or not, are all guilty of judgment of people. All of us. Let me tell you why. I knew, you know, we we have a document that we create for what we're going to be preaching on, and I knew weeks ago this was my subject. And I started my study process and started thinking about it and started digging in and 
then I started realizing, wow, Tommy, you sure do form a whole lot of opinions about things. You sure do come to a lot of conclusions about things. And here's what I know to be true. I know this to be true is that there are potentially people in this room that have formed an opinion or a conclusion because of someone's race or ethnicity. I believe there are people in this room who have formed an opinion or a conclusion based on someone's economic status or their social status in life. I believe there are people in this room who have formed an opinion or a conclusion about people who their general appearance looks different than yours. You know those people with tattoos, right? I believe there are people who have formed an opinion or a conclusion about the way people talk or the language that they use. I believe that we form an opinion or a conclusion on the way that people dress or lack thereof, and the list could go on and on. I mean, let's just admit it. Some of you formed an opinion or a conclusion of me because I said I shop at Kroger's. (laughs) Shame on you. I caught you, right? But hear this. Far too often, far too often, our opinion and our conclusion leads to condemnation without mercy. Don't miss that. Far too often, our opinion and our conclusion leads to condemnation without mercy. They don't do it the way that I do it. They don't think about it the way that I think about it. They don't live the way that I live. They don't look the way that I look. They don't act the way that I act. And what we're doing when we do that is we're putting ourselves in a seat that we should never occupy because it's God's seat. We have to be careful. So Jesus goes on to use an illustration that we're all probably pretty familiar with if you've been in church any of your life. In fact, someone might have used this against you before. Look back at Matthew 7, beginning with verse 3. Jesus says, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, hey, let me take that speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So what Jesus is saying is he says, hey, who are you to have this hunk of wood hanging out of your eyeball when your brother has a speck in his? Which, by the way, I got to tell this story real quick. You don't think this is bad. It's actually good. I was, I was thinking, I want to have a realistic log. Where am I going to find a realistic log? And I actually thought that I was going to have to come out here to the back of the church property with a chainsaw and cut something. But Thursday night, the storm that came through early Friday morning, my next door neighbor lost a big hunk of one of his trees in his front yard. And so I, I saw it, I texted him, I said, hey man, did you do a little tree trimming last night in the storm? <laughs> trying to be funny and he said no I'm gonna get to it later and I said well I'll bring my chainsaw over we can do it no 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 anyway I did I grabbed the chainsaw we went over there within an hour hour and a half we had it all cut up and dragged to the curb and while we were doing it I said hey uh can I grab this log he goes yeah and I said well I've got a sermon illustration this Sunday about having a log in your eye this one would be perfect and I said I didn't know where I was going to get a log. I'm just sorry that God took your tree out to get me one. (laughs) 
So I don't know that he likes me anymore. But uh, <laughs> anyway, Jesus, Jesus says in Matthew, he says, how can you see the speck in your brother's eye when you have this log in your eye? Now, here's what I found really interesting as I was studying this. Never seen this before. But I've always thought of speck as like sawdust. Like, you like me? I mean, that's what I've always thought. But as I began studying a little bit more, that word speck actually translates better twig. Now, the interesting thing is, <laughs> there is a big difference. And Jesus says, hey, listen, why are you concerned about the twig in your brother's eye when you've got this honking log hanging out of your eye? Which brings me to a point that I want to make right here, and it's this. To judge gives us a false view of ourselves. When you judge someone, you're just creating a false view of yourself. Why? Because when we, don't miss it, when we form an opinion or a conclusion about someone, oftentimes it's from a root of self-righteousness. We do it because we want to kind of build ourselves up. The very idea of a self-righteous person is that of condemnation. And so we have to be careful in that. Because whether we care to admit it or not, Oftentimes, the very thing that we wrestle with in someone else's life, don't miss this, is oftentimes something that we are struggling with in our own lives. I found that true in my own life. So the challenge that Jesus is making is this. See this. Self-evaluation is more important than over-evaluation of others. What Jesus is saying by, hey, why don't you take care of the log in your eye, and then you'll be able to see clearly the speck or the twig in your brother's eye. In other words, do a self-evaluation of yourself before passing judgment on others. So as I told you, over the past couple of weeks, I've really been thinking about this idea of judgment. I've really been thinking about this idea of, of uh, developing an opinion or developing a, a conclusion without really knowing all the facts. And you know what I discovered? Man, I'm bad at that. I'm just... I'm just bad at it. I mean, I think sometimes I could take this, and I'll use this as an example. I can take this thought, and I can hear my kids speaking to my wife, and I hear them speaking to my wife in a way that I don't like, and I go, hey, don't talk to your mother like that. But then I have to think, oh, <laughs> I remember when I said such and such to Susan because I was frustrated and I said it in front of the kids. Maybe my example wasn't as good as I thought it was. There's that log sticking out of my eyeball when I'm trying to take the twig out of my own kid's eye. Say, I know what to think. Tommy, you mean, you mean we can't ever deal with like things with our kids and stuff like that? No, I'm not saying that at all. And that's not what Jesus is saying. Here's the hope that we find in this whole deal. The hope that we find in this whole deal is that Jesus says, if you will deal with the log, then you'll be able to see clearly to take care of the twig. You know, I, you know me and my, my weed eating. I love to weed eat. And I'm going to go ahead and admit it. I don't wear goggles. I don't wear safety glasses. I know, judge me right now. You're judging me. I hear you. 
you're not listening to the sermon. Here you are judging me. And inevitably, every once in a while, something hits the fence, something hits right in the eyeball. And I'm sitting there going, oh, it'll come out eventually. And then, you know, I got to go in the house and look in the mirror. And sure enough, there's a speck of dirt or mud or something. I got to dig it out. And all. Oh, I can see now. See, you can, if you deal with what's in your eye, you can ultimately see better. If you deal with the log, you'll be able to see better. Here's the good news. The good news is, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And maybe if when we're dealing with the log in our eye, it gives us a perspective from uh, experience instead of judgment that we can speak to the person who has the twig. Did you hear that? If we deal with the log in our eye, sometimes it moves us to a position of experience instead of judgment. You know, uh, back to my story of jury duty. I don't know if I'm going to get selected or not. I'll be honest with you. I'm not going to fight it if I do or don't. But let's say I get selected. What I do know is I cannot walk into that courtroom and look at the person who has been charged and by the way they look that day decide guilt or innocence. What I also know is that I can't look at their defense lawyer who comes across as a jerk. No offense, any defense lawyers in the room. And go, they must be guilty because they got a sleazy lawyer. Or I I can't look at them and, and decide that they're guilty because of the even the accusation that's been made against them. What I have to do is I have to look at the actual facts. The actual facts. Not come to a conclusion, not come to an opinion. i got to deal with the facts. Jesus said, if you will deal with the facts, take the log out, you'll be able to see more clearly. I just wonder, who today might have a log of prejudice? Who today might have a log of financial success, so much so that you look on someone that does not have the success that you have and think less of them? Who might have the log of growing up with two parents in your household and you don't understand the burden of the one that did not? And go on and on and on. I don't know what your log may be, but I do know this. Jesus said, if you will deal with it, then you'll be able to see more clearly. A log does not disqualify you, but it does give you better perspective. Let me close with a couple of passages of Scripture that I think are important to share. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Not judgment, gentleness. But keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Get this, bear one another's burden, not speak about their burden. Bear one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if any of you thinks he is something when he is nothing, he only deceives himself. Out of, as followers of Christ, we ought to relate to one another and even to those who are far away from Christ through a heart of meekness and gentleness and understanding. But I think most of all, there's a guy who understands this idea of potentially having a really fat log in the eye. His name was David. O King David. Had life by the tail, but he messed up. Listen to what David said to the Lord in Psalms 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. 
Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Get this. Confession first. Then what does he say? Verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Lord, take the log out of my eye first. Lord, help me deal with this thing. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and then, then I can help my brother up so that they can walk in you. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for the truth of your word and how it speaks to our hearts and challenges us and stretches us. And God, I just pray that each one of us would do a little self-evaluation this weekend or maybe this week that we would look potentially at what log weight we might be wagging around and that we would come to you and confess it and deal with it so that we can step alongside someone instead of being a judge, be a helper. Instead of being someone who pushes others down, that we could lift them up. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.